Um, so this reading is going to be from the book of Proverbs 1, 1 to 7, it's in your handout. And it goes like this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools just despise wisdom and instruction. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be back. Uh, it's great to see so many of you guys here as well for P-Day. Uh, why don't I pray for us? Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that uh, you're a good and gracious God. Uh, you send your Son to live the life we can't, to die the death we deserve. We thank you, Lord, that in him we have new life. And though we may have exams to study for and our future to look forward to, uh, it's nothing compared to the future that Christ has in store for us. So grant us, Lord, uh, deep wisdom, that we may live lives that are pleasing to you as we long for the day that Christ returns. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, last year I was on holidays uh, with my uh, family, uh, Kylie and the kids in Malaysia. And, and Kylie's family is from Malaysia, and she's got family who live at very, in various cities uh, in Malaysia. And so we decided to uh, get a car to drive around to visit them and to explore, explore this amazing uh, country. Now, some people said, you know, Dave, you're crazy for thinking that you should drive in Malaysia. Uh, and, and so, you know, there are lots of um, uh, things about um, Malaysia and uh, driving Malaysia. There's a website um, uh, that gives some tips about the local laws. So, for example, uh, what are the white lines on the roads? Uh, and the answer is this. They, these are known as the lane markers and were used by the British in the colonial days to help them drive straight. Today, their purpose is mainly decorative. Uh, or take this question uh, about the speed limit. Well, what's the speed limit in Malaysia? Well, the concept of speed limit is unknown in Malaysia. Now, don't get me wrong, we love Malaysia. Uh, we love driving in Malaysia. It's great fun. But I think we've seen it all. Jumping the queue, ignoring lane markings, driving in the wrong direction, and even creating creative ways of moving furniture. Now, of course, I'm generalising, aren't I? Now, not all Malaysians drive like this. I've been told that there are some who don't, and, and they're called expats. <laughs> Now, whether we think we're a good driver or not, uh, at some point, I mean, some of you guys might not even be driving yet. Uh, you're so young. But um, <laughs> look, if, if you want to drive one day, uh, at some point in your life, then uh, most likely uh, you'll need a teacher, maybe a dad or mum, a driving instructor, someone to teach you how to drive. And life can be like that too, can't it? Uh, we, we all need to learn how to do life. Uh, to learn what's right and wrong, to learn social etiquette and how to make decisions. Uh, and like driving, some of us seem to cruise through life uh, while some of us get anxious at every intersection in our lives. Now, uh, Some of us find it easy to navigate through life while some of us get lost a lot in life. And now if you wanted to become a better driver, you could take advanced courses like the Amy Skill Driver course. But if you want to be a better person, uh, to be, be better at doing life, uh, who do you go to? But deep down, we know, don't we, that we're not living the best life we could possibly live. So who do you turn to? Who do you lean to? Maybe you could go to your family or friends. Oprah or Dr. Phil. Uh, maybe open a book or two. Uh, in, in the city I live in, in Burundara, uh, the library has over 3,000 self-help books. Uh, I went on YouTube and there are 75, 754, I'm sorry, 754 million videos on how to, how to stop bullying, how to uh, find happiness, how to learn how to step on air. I'm not sure how, <laughs> how you do that. But, or, how, how, or, or how to be a dad. And you know, there are so many self-help books, so many videos that you can watch. You could spend your whole life doing that and still not live a good life. Still not live a better life. You, you, you won't even go through all the material, get through all the material. Now, there's some really great stuff out there, but, but when it comes down to uh, doing life well, we, we want to thrive in life, don't we? Not waste our lives. We want to go, and if that's the case, there's no better person to go back to uh, than to the one who gives us life. 
You see, to go anywhere else isn't worth the risk. So imagine you've got lots of money, and you want to invest your money, you, you can do it alone. You can use your intuition. Uh, maybe even, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to be clever about it, or whatever it might be. But you'd be wise to seek financial advice, or at least read a, a book or two. If you want to renovate your bathroom, uh, you can go it alone and don't employ anyone to help you, but it'd be wise, wouldn't it, to at least consult a carpenter and a tiler, uh, a builder, or some contractors and engineers, or whatever it might be. You see, when it comes to important things in our lives, it's not worth the risk to go it alone, to go in blind. Uh, it, it's, there's just too much at stake. And so if you're willing to take uh, financial advice, if you've got money to invest, uh, to engage in builder, to get your bathroom renovated, how much more should we go back to the source of life, to get to know how to make the most of our lives? <clears throat> and that's what we want to do this um, afternoon. Uh, this afternoon on P-Day, Pizza, prayer, and Proverbs. How's that? Uh, to learn from the one who gave us life, to know how to live our lives. And so today, I'm only going to cover uh, the first seven verses. You'd be happy to know. Otherwise, you'd probably miss your exams if we were going to cover the whole book. Um, so the first seven verses are, are a bit like the, f- the introduction to the first nine chapters. And the first nine chapters uh, kind of introduces the whole uh, of Proverbs. But we'll look at the first seven verses. And it's very straightforward. There are only uh, four things to uh, be reflecting on. Uh, again, four Ps. Uh, Bryn helpfully mentioned that um, on this P day, there are many Ps. Um, the person, the purpose, the pattern, and the posture. So first, the person who wrote it. Who wrote Proverbs? Well, verse 1 tells us that it was uh, the main author is King Solomon. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Now, if you were an Israelite living in Israel 3,000 years ago, and Solomon just published this, and you saw it, you'd be like a little three-year-old girl with an ice cream cone. You'd be so excited about what has just been delivered into your hands, because King Solomon wasn't just an ordinary king. He was the wisest of all the kings. When God asked him what he wanted, he didn't ask for fame or fortune, he asked for wisdom and discernment. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom. And very great insight. And a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. And if you want to learn about financial investment, there's no better person to go to than Warren Buffett. And in Old Testament times, if you wanted to learn wisdom, there was no better person to go to than King Solomon. Uh, 1 Kings 4 tells us he, he spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. And so, who wrote it? Solomon. And what was his purpose? Well, his purpose, um, he makes clear in verses 2 to 5. Have a look at it with me. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, For receiving instruction in prudent behaviour, doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to those who are single, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. Now Solomon's talking to the simple youth in verse 4. But he's also talking to the wise and discerning in verse 5. So so what he's doing is that he's saying to the youth, uh, don't be gullible and naive, learn wisdom and be wise. But he's also speaking to the wise and the discerning. And he's saying to the wise, don't think you're too wise to stop learning. No, keep learning wisdom and become wiser still. And so if you're young and naive, or you think you're wise and old, Proverbs is for you. It's for everyone, every single one of us. And so uh, Joshua Ng, who uh, wrote a great Bible study um, uh, on uh, learning Proverbs, uh, this is what he says in it. Proverbs would say that what's most important is not your IQ, contrary to what your university might say, right? but your WQ, your wisdom quotient. Unlike your IQ, our IQ, our WQ can keep increasing no matter who we are. And that's what we want, isn't it? To be wise and to have a WQ that keeps increasing over and over as we get older and older. But you might be wondering, what's wisdom? Uh, what's... <coughs> What's wisdom? 
Oh, well, wisdom's described in detail in, in these verses as well. Wisdom involves, verse 2, knowledge. Uh, but it's more than knowing facts. It's, it's knowing how to apply those facts in life. Uh, wisdom also involves prudence in verses 3 and 4. Uh, so it exercises care and good judgment it, and makes decisions that will achieve the best outcome. Uh, wisdom can also have a moral dimension in verses 3 and 5 uh, in being able to discern what's right and just and fair. Now, sometimes it's hard to think about wisdom in all these ways, but the reality is that we exercise this sort of wisdom all the time as, as the different aspects of wisdom come into play when we make decisions in life. Uh, so I'll just give you a, a simple example. Uh, so, so months ago, um, uh, my family and I we were up the coast uh, in uh, north of Sydney, uh, just on holidays, and Maddie had just started learning to uh, bodyboard, and she loved it. She loves catching the waves and, and just having a lot of fun out in the sea. And so uh, we were up there. Uh, it was a new beach that we had never been to, but she was really, really keen to do it. And so I said, look, okay, why don't we go? So we walked over this massive uh, sand dune, uh, and on the other side, we saw the water. We walked to it. We got into the water uh, just a little bit, and then we stopped and stared at each other. And we were like, whoa, actually, the waves are way bigger than we had expected. And in fact, the waves weren't just coming from one direction. They were coming from multiple directions. And then on the side, we also noticed that there were a lot of big rocks. And then we kind of thought, actually, there are no flags. No one's actually swimming here. We noticed a fisherman on the side. And so I asked Maddie, do you still want to do it? And she goes, mm, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're not very strong swimmers, but it looked very dangerous. So we, we thought, look, we'll go talk to the um, fisherman and see what he's caught. And as we were going there, a person on a quad bike came by. And he said to us, were well, you planning to go in? And we said to the lifeguard, yeah, but we've kind of decided not to anymore. And he goes, that's a good idea because this is the second most dangerous trip of beach on the eastern coast of Australia. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> Even in making that decision, so many things came to, into play. To assess the situation, to work out what will be best, what will be prudent, what will be wise. And we make those sorts of decisions every day, don't we? We exercise wisdom to know when to cross the road, uh, to arrange our day activities, uh, to prioritise what's most important. Uh, we, when we change lanes uh, on the freeway or when we set up our alarm clock for that exam the next day. But when it comes to navigating through life's challenges and disappointments, uh, thinking through our career and our relationships, who to marry, what job should I take, where should I settle, all these big questions require even more wisdom, don't they? Sometimes they're not so cut and dry, so sometimes they're hard to discern and determine what will be best, what will be prudent, what will be wise. Uh, Joshua again says this, wisdom is not about getting a master's degree, so much as mastering life. Wisdom is about being street smart rather than just having lots of theoretical knowledge. And so the book of Proverbs offers us wisdom for living, wisdom that enables us to live a good and godly life that God wants us to, a wisdom to make the most out of life, wisdom to enjoy all that life has to offer. Uh, let me give you a, a, a taste. So in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, uh, uh, we're told, Whoever walks with the wise become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. That's so true, isn't it? We, we've all seen that growing up. If you mix uh, with the wrong crowd when you're growing up, then it's so easy to, to do things you shouldn't be doing and, and to follow the fool. Instead, you could be sitting with the Asian study and going to choose, or whatever it is. You know what I mean. It's so true, isn't it? It's so true. No, it's not, life's not all about studying, by the way. Or, or take Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, I'm sure we agree with this proverb. How often do we see anger? And we know that if we get anger and respond in anger... That's not going to help the situation. That gentleness is what's needed. But yet, how often do we respond in anger and not in gentleness? It, it, it's a proverb. It's what we know as wise, but do we apply it in our lives? 
You see, the book of Proverbs isn't just a list of short, pithy insights to be memorised, but wisdom to be lived out in everyday life. Uh, as one commentator, commentator put it, a person could memorise the book of Proverbs and still lack wisdom if it did not affect his heart, which informs behaviour. So we're seeing the, the person and the purpose of Proverbs. So now we'll have a look at the pattern and then the posture. Uh, the book of Proverbs has two main sections, as I uh, mentioned, chapters 1 to 9 and 10 to 31. And what I'm hoping to do as I uh, bring you God's word from the first few verses is to wake your appetite and to encourage you to keep reading wisdom, uh, reading Proverbs, sorry, so that you may gain wisdom. Now, the first nine chapters sets the scene for the rest. And one of the things it does is to convince us not to follow uh, uh, Madam Folly, but to follow Lady Wisdom. Uh, but in chapters 10 to 31, what we find uh, isn't a chapter on friendship, and then another chapter on marriage, and then another chapter on career, and another chapter on part-time jobs at Coles or whatever it is. You see, that's what we would love, wouldn't it? We would love for Proverbs to just give us headings and all the wisdom related to that field. And that would be so wonderful. Wouldn't it be so, oh, I'm having friendship problems. Flip, 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 friendship. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I see, they're the problem. No, no, no. No, you see, like... <laughs> See, Proverbs doesn't, isn't written like that because life is not like that. Our lives aren't compartmentalised. Our lives overlap with all the, those categories that come into play. Our friendships cross over with church and with work and with CU and with studies. Do you, do you know what I mean? So because our lives aren't compartmentalised like that, so Proverbs is written so that it affects all of our lives in every area of our lives, not just in one aspect of our lives. And so, uh, 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 the pattern of teaching we find in the book of Proverbs is, is in a range of different types of expressions of wisdom in all the messiness of our lives. So verse 6, have a look at that. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. That is, the, the book of Proverbs contains all these things, Proverbs and parables, sayings and riddles. Uh, and this means that the book of Proverbs isn't a book that you can just skim through and read and, and think that it will just change your life. No, it's a book that requires deep reflection. Uh, sometimes the wisdom is subtle, sometimes it's ambiguous, but we need to store up this wisdom so that we can learn when to apply one proverb and another proverb. It's not an automatic process, but a learning process that grows with time, experience and grace. And so the last uh, uh, bit of the passage is about the posture. How do we get wisdom? It's not just about reading it. It's inwardly digesting it. But it's actually more than that as well. We need to have the right posture when we come to wisdom. And that is the posture of fear. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Without the alphabet, you can't read. Without maths, you can't... Sorry, without numbers, you can't do maths. Well, maths, you have no numbers. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> and without the fear of the Lord, there is no true wisdom. Now, there are two types of uh, fear. Uh, the first is the fear uh, um, of God that is a bit more obvious. Don't mess with God. Basically, <laughs> you know, if there was a UFC fighter and he goes, he calls you into the ring, don't, don't go in. Because he'll knock you out. <laughs> it's not safe. That, that, that's realistic fear. That's right fear. That's fear that you should heed. And so don't mess with it. Have fear of God that is, turn back to God. Don't let God be your enemy. Turn to him so that he's your father. Turn to God so that he's not your enemy. Turn to God so that he is your friend. That he won't be standing in the ring against you, but he'll be standing in the ring with you. And he'll be for you. That's the first and most important thing. We must fear God. And to fear God means you're not going to mess with him. 
you're going to turn back to him. So let me encourage you to do that if you haven't already. Now, the second one is a bit uh, uh, less obvious and sometimes a bit more confusing, particularly for Christians. What does it mean for Christians to keep fearing God? Uh, well, let, uh, let, let me give you an example uh, to help you think through this. Uh, so in 2001, uh, Will Smith, uh, he played the role of Muhammad Ali in a blockbuster, a Hollywood blockbuster. And I, I, a couple of years ago, I remember watching a documentary uh, about the making of this movie. And Will Smith talked about how he, he was so terrified of meeting Ali for the first time. Uh, now, by this time, remember, you know, he's done uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and all these uh, um, uh, Men in Black and so forth. He was a Hollywood A-lister, a really famous dude. Everyone wanted to be with Will Smith. Everyone would have trembled at his feet. But he trembled at Ali's feet. And so he had so much respect for Ali because he believed that Ali was even better than him. Was even more important of him. So he had all this awe for Ali. He was scared uh, to disappoint Ali in this movie, to misrepresent him in any way. So he worked really hard for two years to get his body into shape, to get his skills up to scratch. And Will Smith went through a complete transformation to do Ali's life justice on film. He spared no time, no money, no effort to do the best he could. And when the movie was released, um, uh, Will Smith and Muhammad Ali were on Oprah. And Oprah asked Ali, Will Smith did a good job. And Will Smith said this, the champ looked at me and gave me that nod that I did a good job. The work, I worked as hard as I possibly could have worked. Will Smith was so relieved that Ali liked his performance because he was so afraid to disappoint this man who he had such reverent awe for. In, in other words, you can say that Will Smith feared Ali. Not that Ali will slap him around, but to disappoint him. To disappoint Ali, to let him down. And so Muhammad, uh, no, sorry, uh, Will Smith had such reverent fear, joyful fear of Ali that he did all he could to please Ali. And that's the kind of fear that God wants us to have. Because you're not going to make wise decisions in God's eyes if you're not trying to please Him, ultimately. You're not going to make wise decisions in God's eyes if you're not scared of disappointing Him. If you, want to, if you want God to look good, you joyfully fear Him. If you want God to be worshipped and praised, and your friends, and your family, then you joyfully obey Him. If you struggle with pornography and you search the scriptures and learn to that fling sexual morality is the right thing, the wise thing, the God-honoring and pleasing thing, then you do it out of rightful fear of God. And if you struggle with greed, you'll search the scriptures and learn that greed is idolatry. You'll repent of your greed and find your security in Christ alone. Like Will Smith, you'll spend no time, no money and no effort to do the best you can so that God will be worshipped and God will be praised. You won't care so much about what people think of you. You'll care way more what God thinks of you. Because if you truly fear God, then you won't fear anyone else. But you can only have this joyful fear of God if you know deep down that God won't hurt you. You only have this joyful fear of God if you know deep down that he won't condemn you. When you stuff up. Solomon was a very wise king. The wisest of all the Old Testament kings. But he didn't always apply the wisdom he had. Instead of remaining 100% devoted and fearful of God, he married 700 wives, took on 300 concubines, and as he grew older, he worshipped their idols. You see, Solomon's problem wasn't that he never feared God. Solomon's problem was that he stopped fearing God. He got distracted and stopped pleasing God with his whole life and ended up being a big disappointment to God. And unfortunately, many of his sons did as well. But despite this, God promised a king that wouldn't. A king who will not only save his people, but a king who would reign wisely. So in Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, we see 
uh, uh, the prophecy. The days are coming, declares the Lord. When I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous saviour. Solomon was the one who brought kingship and wisdom together. But it is Jesus who fulfills both of them perfectly. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus says, The queen of self will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon was great, no doubt. But Jesus is greater. And if the queen of the self went to Solomon to listen to his wisdom, how much more must we go to Jesus for his incomparable wisdom? Solomon may have been given wisdom by God, but Jesus is wisdom from God. Solomon might have lost his kingdom because of his foolishness, but Jesus builds his kingdom by his wisdom. Solomon failed to obey his own wisdom, but in Jesus is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In fact, he was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. And this has huge implications for how we're to live. You see, if you want to know how to do life and get the most out of life, uni, even Bible college might help a little, but coming to Jesus over and over again is the wisest thing you can ever do. Because he wasn't just the one who lived the best life, he's the one who offers us life. And it was in God's wisdom that at the cross, God punished our sins, our flaws, our failings, in Jesus, so that we don't have to receive the punishment and the wrath of God. So that those who do come to him won't have to fear God as a righteous judge, but to joyfully fear him as our personal saviour. What God did was foolish in the world's eyes, but what he did was wiser than the wisdom of this world. And so when we come to Jesus, the world will think we're fools. But we'll be doing the wisest thing we've ever done. To have our sins forgiven. To call Jesus our brother and our saviour. But you have to also remember that coming to Jesus is not a once-off event. You come to Jesus for salvation, absolutely. But you must keep coming back to him. For the forgiveness of your sins. As you continue to repent as you continue to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. To keep coming back to Jesus for more and more wisdom to know how to do this life. And every time we do, the world will look at us and think we're fools. Like when we refuse to slander or gossip in the morning tea room. Like when we skip extra time studying, like now, to, run, uh, to, to come to P-Day. Or on Friday nights to still run youth group in the middle of exams. The world will think us fools when we... Not take up a promotion because the cost to our family and our, our, our church will be too high. The world will think we're fools when we live for Christ and his wisdom. So friends, how are you navigating through life at the moment? Research shows that a third of car accidents happen within a one-mile radius of the motorist's home. One reason for this is obvious. We spend most of our time driving around our homes because we're always going home. <laughs> but the other reason is due to complacency. We're so familiar with the surroundings of our home that it's easy for us to switch on to autopilot. Uh, and so we're not as careful and as attentive as we could be, like how fast we're taking that last corner. Being a Christian can be like that. As we navigate through the complexity of life, we're tempted to go into auto drive and assume the gospel rather than live out the gospel. We're tempted to become complacent. Rather than make decisions out of joyful fear of God, we make decisions out of fear of others. And so we, we slowly drift and forget the gospel. And it's easy for you guys in five or ten years' time to be thinking, oh, no, no, I did all the hard yards of growing as a Christian on P-Day, during my Christian Union days. But now, look, 
life is too complex, too difficult, too many things to juggle, I'm too tired, I've got too many responsibilities, I can't read my Bible today. I can't go to church this week. I can't disciple someone now. It's so easy for us to assume that the work is done. We can now cruise. But friends, let me encourage you, never go on autopilot as a Christian. Keep coming to Jesus. Keep seeking his wisdom so that the life that you live will be a life that is fearful of him. So when suffering comes, don't let your natural response be to not trusting God's wisdom and blame God for his lack of wisdom. When monetary opportunities arise, don't let your natural response be to uh, 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 count the dollar signs. But instead, let it be counting the cost of discipleship. When, when, when you get a bad mark for your essay, don't, don't let your natural response be bad and worrying about your average score. But be thankful for the feedback and learn from it. You see, true wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. And so, friends, as you study the Bible and go to NTE, don't let all that knowledge puff you up, but let that knowledge sink in deeply so that it causes you to fear God more and more. So that when you're making a big decision in life and you think through how to serve and bless your church, what you'll bring with you isn't just knowledge, but wisdom. And not just wisdom, but joyful fear of God. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that means wisdom is going to be a lifelong process of getting. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here and for those of us here who may not yet be a Christian. I pray that we might all have fear of you. If we're not a Christian, that we will fear you and turn back to you for the forgiveness of our sins. And if we already belong to you, that we may keep turning back to you, seeking to please you with our lives, seeking your wisdom to know how to do life so that our life will reflect the life of Jesus and by it bring others along with us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name.